open on the air tonight with the latest from Georgia, where we're about to turn the page to the next phase of one of the criminal cases involving the former president. Now that all his co-defendants have been booked and processed, but only one mugshot is making memes and money tonight. More on what happens next for Donald Trump as we take you live to Atlanta. Plus, developing tonight, deadly storms sweeping the Midwest, flooding towns, triggering tornadoes with more warnings tonight. We're live where it's happening. And in our American Dream series, the startling stats at some of New York City's most elite public schools. Why some advocates say black and Latino students aren't getting a fair shot. Plus, an incredible story out of Arizona of a woman who slipped a stranger a note to save her own life. We'll explain. And Simone Biles back in a big way, hitting the mat in a spectacular return to the sport. She's helped redefine what it means for next year's Olympics a little later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight it is official. Every co-defendant of former President Donald Trump, including Mr. Trump himself, has now turned themselves in to kick off what is the very beginning of a long road lined with legal and political minefields. Want to show you here all 19 people, all of them, now charged, fingerprinted, booked in this criminal case, alleged to have tried to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 election results in Georgia. The last couple to surrender before that noon deadline today, Travian Cootie, the former publicist for Ye, the rapper formerly known as Kanye West, and Stephen Lee, a pastor based in Illinois. Already this historic photo, this one, the first mugshot ever of a former president, is getting deployed on the campaign trail, leveraged as merch by Mr. Trump and his team. Think T-shirts, mugs, decals. On the other side, it's being used as evidence by Mr. Trump's critics to argue an alleged criminal shouldn't be commander in chief. In all, in this case and three others, he is facing a total of 91 charges. In one of those other cases, the federal election interference one, there's a key hearing on Monday. That's when we may find out a trial date as the campaign calendar collides with the courts. I want to bring in Vaughn Hilliard, who is live for us on the ground in Atlanta. We have seen so many developments, Vaughn, not just in the last 24 hours, obviously, but over the last week and a half. Talk about where this goes next, because next step now is an arraignment, right? What does that look like for not just these 18 other co-defendants, but for Mr. Trump himself? Could his appearance be waived? Could he show up virtually? Right, we're looking at the arraignment the week of September 5th there, or the week of Labor Day for Donald Trump and these other defendants. Uh, for the case here in the state of Georgia, there are the opportunities for defendants to waive their appearance. So it may not be necessary for Donald Trump to come back here to the state of Georgia for some time, now that he is officially surrendered and booked. There are going to be numerous filings. His new attorney has already done exactly that. Uh, objecting to an expedited trial uh, date of October, which one of the other defendants, one of his former attorneys, had uh, proposed and the judge ultimately agreed to. So there is a, a complicated calendar of motions ahead. You can look at the political calendar because, really, that is running perpendicular to the potential uh, legal calendar for Donald Trump here. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, come January. January 2nd is the day that prosecutors from special counsel Jack Smith's office has proposed that his uh, federal charges, the hearing in that case, in that trial begin. But then you start to look, it's a very complicated calendar ahead. And Donald Trump has been clear that he doesn't want any of these trials to begin until after 2024, Hallie. So here we are, Vaughn, two days after the first Republican primary debate, one day after former President Trump surrendered himself on these charges in Georgia, leaning into the weekend. We know he's getting back on the campaign trail in the days to come. What's the vibe check from the sources you're talking to in the campaign? Right. I'm told that they're going to try to make uh, everything out of the legal situation that he finds himself, is, finds himself in and turn it to his political advantage. You know, it was one ally of his telling me that this was uh, will be the most iconic photograph in American history. We saw that uh, be posted not only on his true social account, but his first Twitter post in more than two and a half years since just after the January 6th attack. You know, for Donald Trump, he's already selling mugs, he's selling T-shirts, bumper stickers, uh, beer koozies with the mugshot uh, image on it, because the donations that Americans are making uh, to his campaign, 90 percent of it, they actually go to the actual 2024 political campaign, but the other 10 percent go toward his leadership pack, which has been paying his legal bills, which uh, could very well likely get very costly here in the months ahead, Hallie.
Vaughn Illiard live for us in Atlanta. Vaughn, thank you so much. I want to take you to Maui now, where there are some late-breaking developments tonight. New details now on one of the biggest problems on the island. The thousands of people displaced when their homes were incinerated. And the clock now ticking, we're learning, for them to potentially have no place to go. Our NBC News team is on the ground talking with people there who have lost family members who are furious because they say FEMA and the government are only giving them a couple more weeks of housing. Listen. None of us have time to grieve. When you have to worry about where you're going to live, how can you even have time to grieve? How can you plan a funeral? How can you anything? It comes as officials are releasing the names of nearly 400 people still missing now more than two weeks since that devastating firestorm swept across the island destroying the historic town of Lahaina. At least 115 people have been confirmed dead. And as we've been saying for days now, it is entirely possible and entirely likely that number could go up. I want to bring in Steve Patterson on the ground on Maui. And Steve, housing concerns. This is becoming a, an issue in a very serious way for people. What's the update on that? And what else are we hearing? I mean, first of all, there's no long-term plan. And I think that's what people mm. are running into because Frankly, Maui has a limited amount of space. It's an island, 735 square feet. You have, yes, resorts and hotels, but unless these hotels, like the Four Seasons, decides to give up rooms for free long term, that's not going to happen. FEMA cannot commandeer rooms. So you have a situation in which there was already a housing crisis in Maui. I spoke to one couple, sorry, one woman. She's a, she's a single mom. She's got two kids. She just got approved for low-income housing in Lahaina six months ago. Six months later, her house burns down. She and her family have now been to three separate places in the last three weeks. And next week, she has no idea where she's going to go. She is one of dozens of families who are experiencing the same thing. And it's very difficult difficult because it's hard to find a place to put these people. Uh, FEMA, you know, in the past, we've talked about the campfire. You think of Hurricane Katrina. The image that you think of when you think of FEMA is, okay, trailers, right? So they're going to bring in this, this makeshift city and put people there. Very difficult to do in a place like Maui. So all of these combinations of things are piling up. And until we hear a long-term plan from the government and from yeah. FEMA, it, it's going to be anxiety for a lot of folks here. Holly. Yeah, we've, we're just getting into, uh, from the governor and from officials there, some numbers saying that some 3,000 survivors of the wildfire uh, have been moved to these sort of contracted hotels, something like 4,400 yep. shelter survivors and hotel employees, 900 people in Airbnbs. But as you say, there is still a huge question mark on what the road to recovery, what the next month, two months, three months longer looks like. We're also getting this news of these 388 people still missing. And this is significant because this is the first time... Steve, right, that we are getting sort of a very clear and definitive list of who is still unaccounted for from the from from officials. Every number that you've heard before, this number has been from maybe a dozen different lists, county, yeah. city, uh, Red Cross, all compiling the list together. That's how they're getting the information. This list is compiled by the FBI. It has names that people can say, that's my family member's name. I can check that person off the list. I can submit DNA to find out if their body is among the dead. That's the work that has to be done now. They're trying to pare down that list so people and families feel like there's accountability, and they feel like that they can sleep at night knowing what has happened to their family member. It's the most important thing that's happening on this island right now. Allie. Steve Patterson, live for us there on Maui. Steve, thank you. Overseas now, Russian President Vladimir Putin signing an order today to force all mercenaries to pledge their allegiance to Russia with more and more questions tonight about what caused that plane crash that supposedly killed a top mercenary leader, Evgeny Prigozhin. Remember him? He's the guy that led that coup, that attempted coup, the march on Moscow a couple months ago. The Kremlin today is saying, hey, it wasn't us. They're calling speculation that Putin ordered a hit on Prigozhin an absolute lie, in their words. But we are getting some new video of the wreckage showing the wing from the plane, apparently miles away from the rest of the crash site. Russian investigators are also saying late tonight they've found the flight recorder, in other words, the black box there, no official confirmation yet that Prigozhin's body has been found or identified. We still don't know what took that plane down. Josh Letterman is joining us now. And here is this move from Vladimir Putin, right, trying to consolidate power, trying to make sure that other mercenaries are under his rule, essentially. And no surprise here, or may maybe a little bit of one, um, denying that they had anything to do with Prigozhin's death. Walk us through it. 
Well, Holly, if that denial from the Kremlin and those comments from the spokesman for President Putin are any indication, we may not get much closer to knowing what actually happened to that plane than we are right now. In fact, in the 48 hours or so since that plane came down, we have not really gotten much definitive information uh, about exactly what happened, except for what U.S. intelligence and Western intelligence are saying about the fact that they believe there was some type of explosion on board. And when you talk about Putin consolidating power, making them pledge that oath, this is not happening in a vacuum, right? In fact, this was the big friction point between Putin and Prigozhin back when Prigozhin was alive. Remember, a few months ago, President Putin was trying to make all the Wagner fighters sign contracts with the Russian military, essentially bring the Wagner group under the control of the Kremlin. Pogrosian said, absolutely not. And in fact, that's widely believed to be one of the main reasons he ended up launching that mutiny attempt against President Putin. And so we're seeing from the Kremlin a clear sense of their intention. Even if they're denying involvement in this murder, they clearly want to see the Wagner group under their control, not some type of rogue force that can do whatever it wants. I also have a question for you about what we're learning from state media in Belarus, that the president there tipped off, allegedly, Prigozhin about an assassination plot back in January. But help us understand the timeline here. Why yeah. would there have been an assassination plot against Prigozhin in January when his march on Moscow, this attempted coup, didn't happen until June? What, what, what's with that timing? Well, newsflash, Prigozhin had a lot of enemies, not just Putin, but a lot of others around the world. And in fact, it's likely that Lukashenko, the Belarusian leader, wasn't tipping him off about a Putin plot because, in fact, uh, Lukashenko says he sent that message to Prigozhin through the Kremlin, through a Russian ambassador, and then through President Putin's office. And so this is just one more wrinkle, adding to the confusion about what's happened in the last few months and what happened that killed Yevgeny Prigozhin. Josh Letterman, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Back here at home, Fed Chair Jerome Powell saying today inflation is still too high with a new warning now that more interest rate hikes could be coming. Now, you know the deal here, right? The Fed wants to get inflation down to about 2 percent. Right now, it's a bit above 3, 3.2 percent. So that's why he's suggesting they may keep raising interest rates. That matters for mortgage rates, obviously, right? And all of it's coming in the middle of the most unaffordable housing market in about 40 years the backdrop of it all, Zillow, you know, the big real estate marketplace, trying to gin up some business, offering mortgages with a 1% down payment, 1% down. CNBC's Steve Listman is joining us now from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where Powell is making these remarks that obviously, Steve, have Wall Street watching, have Main Street watching. There had been some discussion, right, as these fears of a recession have somewhat abated, at least for now, that perhaps Jay Powell might keep rates kind of kind of steady for a bit. That was not the signal we're getting today. Why does it matter to the average Joe? Well, it matters to the average Joe because rates could go higher. I'm not sure it's a done deal. Um, what he sort of laid out was some criteria that he's looking for. He wants inflation to come down. The Fed has a 2 percent target. Um, and there may be some pressure on inflation this month when it comes to uh, higher oil prices and even some higher food prices. So he was sort of skeptical that the recent decline in inflation, he was kind of like a, a Missourian and show me that this is going to last when it comes to uh, inflation coming down. The economy is running pretty hot and the Fed's idea of how to bring inflation down is to loosen up the economy, loosen up the job market, and that'll create excess in the economy that will help bring down prices. That hasn't happened, even though inflation's come down. So um, I, I think we don't have to worry about interest rates going higher next month. It's really more November when they could go up a quarter point. But bottom line is I would not, if I was sitting there waiting for rates to come down uh, uh, to do something, expect it to come down real soon. Mortgage rates could come down a little bit because they're a little high even relative to where the Fed is. But I don't think a whole lot of relief is coming here. So now you've got Zillow, Steve, everybody's favorite, uh, you know, browse and fantasize site. Well, <laughs> maybe, you know, coming out real, real, from a real estate perspective, saying they're going to offer maybe 1% down. Um, what's the deal there, right? Because that, I can imagine, might seem really appealing to somebody who's looking at these mortgage rates going, well, wait a second, they're the highest they've been in a couple of decades here. I can't swing that for 20% down, but maybe I can for far less. 
Well, that's a real sign of the times, as you talked about. Housing affordability has not gone the way of the average Joe, as you said. Um, it, it's with mortgage rates high and housing prices still high. This is the real conundrum we find ourselves in: that interest rates have gone higher, but the housing market hasn't really cooled that much. Fed Chair Jay Powell even talked about the idea that housing's picking back up, and I think it comes from Haley. What's been going on for 10 years? We've been underbuilding housing in this country. You also have the pandemic, which created this premium for certain kinds of housing where people wanted to live. So it's not any easier right now. And what Zillow's doing is a sign of the times. And people should just be very careful what they get themselves into with those kind of financial arrangements. Yeah, no kidding. Steve Leisman, not a green screen behind you, right? Just a fact check. That's really the Tetons there? No, that's the real thing. That's the real thing. No, that's uh, those are actual mountains. You and the bison, my friend. Thank you, Steve. I'm jealous of that view. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for walking us through it. To a one-two punch now of some really intense weather whipping across the Midwest today. 85 million people are under heat alerts, but it's those deadly storms that folks are still trying to recover from. Look at this. You can see how deep it was for these cars on some of these roads here in Michigan. Wow, look at that. At least five people, including a woman and two little girls, were killed because of really intense winds. At least nine tornadoes have been reported. Something like 550,000 people still do not have power in both that state and Ohio. You have trees uprooted, some of the ground coming with it. And a new tropical storm churning now that could become a hurricane by Sunday and maybe threaten Florida next week. I want to bring in Maggie Vespa, who has been covering all of it. It is a summer of severe weather, and it is whipping right into yep. Labor Day week, right, with no sign of abating. Hallie, exactly. I mean, for those of us exhausted here in the Midwest, like just this week, think about it. We had that severe kind of record smashing heat up in, up in parts of Michigan. Some of the same parts we're talking about today. They had flash floods yesterday. And now today we're talking about these tornadoes overnight just in southeastern Michigan and sort of northern Ohio alone. Nine tornadoes actually confirmed by the National Weather Service. Their surveyors are out right now and five deaths actually confirmed in Michigan, including that car crash that you talked about, a 21 year old woman and two little girls, a one-year-old and a three-year-old girl. Authorities say their car hydroplaned on a highway during the storm. There was also another death on a highway where there was a 25-car pileup, several injuries in that pileup as well, and then finally a fifth death when basically a tree came crashing through a home. When we show you the kinds of damage, the kind of damage that we're talking about and the trees that we're seeing falling, you can understand why this is so dire. Take a listen to this. This is the most intense storm I've ever witnessed in my life. It was pretty scary there for about a uh, half hour there, not knowing what was going on. And we'll note, Hallie, uh, officials in parts of Michigan also declaring states of emergency today, and that's to recover from the floods that they were hit with yesterday. Now they have to clean up from these tornadoes as well. Maggie Hallie. Vespa, it just doesn't end. Thank you. We've got some breaking news now out of Louisiana with a mandatory evacuation order just getting lifted for a town about 40 miles west of New Orleans because of a refinery fire there. Take a look at some of these pictures. These images are just astounding. This huge cloud of smoke. You can see those bright orange flames peeking out from right behind it. Emergency crews showed up to this fire and chemical leak at a storage tank at Marathon Petroleum's refinery in Garyville. Marathon says the fire and this chemical release are contained to its own property here. Nobody was hurt, but everybody who lives and works and goes to school in about a two mile radius of this refinery had to leave for a couple of hours. Cassie Sherm is with our affiliate WDSU. She's joining us now from Garyville. Cassie, it's good to see you. So good news that the evacuation order has been lifted, but this looks pretty serious. What else do we know? How's the air quality? <laughs> That's right, Hallie. Now, one of the things is, is the air quality here is still a big concern because you guys were looking at that video and the pictures of what this area looked like about a couple hours ago, completely filled with smoke, with hazardous material. And you can see back behind me here, it's clear, but it's still hazy from what's being left. Now, take a look at the video from earlier. You can see that dark cloud of smoke coming from Marathon Petroleum and even flames, as officials say, a chemical release caused the very large fire around 7 o'clock, which is still under investigation. Now, it prompted a mandatory 
mandatory evacuation for everyone in that two mile radius. Like you said, more than 8,000 people were evacuated in that two mile area. The burning material, it's naphtha. It's a liquid hydrocarbon mixture used as a component to make gasoline. Now, naphtha is considered a hazardous material by the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the parish conducted an air quality test near this site, and they've been doing this previously as well, but we're still waiting to hear from those results. Now, this isn't the first time crews have responded to a fire at Marathon Petroleum Refinery. There's been at least three fires in the last two years and two of them have had major injuries. Now we're very fortunate in this situation that there were no injuries and I mean one of the biggest things is they say they have when it comes to this they have plays and they have things to do when it comes to the fire. So they have plans in place to try to stop things like this from happening. But we're going to continue to follow this and hopefully this doesn't happen again. Reporting here from Garysville, I'm Cassie Sherm. Back to you. Cassie, thank you so much. It's great to see you there from our affiliate WDSU. Appreciate it. Some workers uh, at big car makers are hitting some practice picket lines in spots around the country after they voted to authorize a strike. If talks with those three big car makers break down, we have just heard now. I mean, this is a potentially huge strike, so big that it's reached the level of President Biden weighing in on it. Here's what he said just a second ago, really just in the last hour when he was asked by reporters. I think that there should be a circumstance where the jobs that are being displaced jobs, they should go to the first choice, should go to the UAW members who had the job, and the salary should be commensurate. The UAW says more than 150,000 of their folks are ready to walk off in the next few weeks, depending on how negotiations go. The workers want Ford, GM, and Stellantis, formerly known as Chrysler, to give them more money, a 46% pay increase over four years, a 32-hour full-time work week, and better benefits, like expanded pensions. If there is a strike, right, and again, not a done deal yet, but if there is one, you could be looking at a loss of $5 billion after 10 days for those car makers. And long term, it might mean prices for new cars goes up. Jesse Kirsch has more. Today, United Auto Workers Union membership voting overwhelmingly in support of authorizing leadership to call for a strike. This does not mean that a strike is a guarantee. It is not a foregone conclusion. However, what this was about was union workers saying that they support their leadership in making the call for a strike if they feel it is necessary. We're talking about something that could happen in the weeks ahead as contracts expire between UAW and the big three, GM, Ford and Stellantis, major automakers in this country. The union is calling for things including a nearly 50 percent pay raise and traditional pensions. So they're making calls for that pointing to profits that these companies are making and arguing that a bigger share of profits needs to be going to these workers that are involved in this production. If a strike were to happen, we could see up to around 150,000 different workers across the country on strike. That could bring car production, new vehicle production, to a halt. And that then could lead to challenges for people who are shopping in a place like this, at a car dealership. Here in the Chicago suburbs, the dealer here tells me that he believes that if there were a strike, he has supply for about two months that would keep conditions as they are right now. But beyond around two months, he thinks it would become more challenging for people to find the cars that they are looking for. And we know it has already been challenging for people to find cars. Another potential issue that could come up with a strike is that if other unions went to stand in solidarity with UAW and created problems delivering parts, that means even if you already have a car, you could face a problem trying to get a repair. So issues potentially for American consumers all over the country if we were to see a strike. But again, that is not a foregone conclusion at this point with negotiations ongoing. We have heard today from Ford and Stellantis in statements, Ford saying in part that it, quote, it, it looks, quote, forward to working with the UAW on creative solutions during this time when our dramatically changing industry needs a skilled and competitive workforce more than ever. Stellantis says in part, quote, the discussions between the company and the UAW's bargaining team continue to be constructive and collaborative. But for now, thousands of jobs, billions of dollars, and potentially your new ride if you're looking to shop for a new car, all on an uncertain road ahead. Back to you.
Number one, Rite Aid is getting ready to file for bankruptcy in the next few weeks to apparently address thousands of lawsuits they're facing over its alleged role in the opioid epidemic, according to the Wall Street Journal. This filing would reportedly cover Rite Aid's $3 billion debt and some of these pending legal issues, including allegations that it oversupplied prescription painkillers. A rep for Rite Aid did not respond to our request for comment. Number two, health officials in Northern California are investigating some rashy stuff after a tough mutter race last weekend. Look at this. Reports of this cropping up on people's bodies, their legs, things like fevers, things like vomiting. Officials think maybe this was all caused by some kind of a bacteria that was in the water on this you know, muddy obstacle course. It's right there in the name. Tough Mudder spokesperson says the group followed all proper protocols and that the health and safety of the people who do these races is a top priority. Number three, a new study out says some paper and bamboo straws have PFAS, those so-called forever chemicals, more often than plastic straws do. At least that's the rate where it's found in these straws. That's according to scientists in Belgium who tested dozens of brands. Exposure to PFAS can be associated with things like high cholesterol and an increased risk of certain cancers. It's in a lot of stuff. We've talked about PFAS a lot on this show. Researchers say they're still trying to figure out which levels of exposure are problematic. Number four, singer Liam Payne says he's postponing his tour after being hospitalized for a serious kidney infection. Remember, he was in One Direction. He now says, as he's on tour solo, they're refunding tickets for people who are going to go to see him in South America. They're working on rescheduling. Number five, it may be time to say goodbye to the beloved pandas at D.C.'s National Zoo. They're going back to China. When the research exchange program that brought them here expires in a few months, right now the zoo hasn't said if or when a new set of pandas could come. Let me tell you, that's like, talk about what's in the group chat in D.C. It's that. Bummer. We love the pandas. New concerns today about a new COVID variant that might be able to get around the kinds of things that protect us from the virus, and that's causing some communities to start masking up again. Scientists say they're watching a variant called BA 2.86. Just... Listen, it's the new variant. I won't make you repeat that. Since it seems to be able to escape some of the antibodies that keep us from getting sick, even for people who are vaccinated or who recently got COVID, the variant's just starting to pop up. There have been a few cases here and around the world. The data coming in is enough for some places to try and get people thinking about doing stuff like masking again. That's what one school in Atlanta is doing. They're also saying, sorry, kids, no parties for the foreseeable future. We've heard from President Biden on this in just the last hour, saying his administration is going to try to help. Listen. Signed off this morning on a proposal we have to present to the Congress a uh, request for additional funding for new vaccine that is necessary, that works. And tentatively, not decided finally yet, tentatively, it is recommended that, it would likely be recommended that everybody get it, no matter whether they got it before. NBC medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now. So, Dr. Natalie, there have been a lot of variants. We've seen a lot of them come and go since the beginning of the pandemic. What makes this one different and of special concern? Yeah, and you know, this is how I frame it, Hallie, is that viruses mutate for a living. This is what they do. They're always trying to become more contagious, but they're not necessarily trying to become more severe because they want to survive also. So we know that we've been talking about hospitalizations creeping up in the last couple of weeks. It's not thought to be due to this particular variant, the BA 2.86. We actually don't know how contagious it is or if it really will cause more severe disease. But this is why experts are so concerned. We do think that it's going to dodge immunity from vaccines as well as previous infections. It's a distant relative from that original Omicron, but it's got a ton of mutations, over 30 mutations in the spike and other parts of the virus that are really going to make it difficult for any vaccine, including the new one coming up, to really protect us. Tests should still work, those rapid antigen PCRs, and Paxlovid should still work the antiviral. But nonetheless, this definitely has experts around the world really watching very, very closely. But so what advice are you giving people who are asking you about boosters, if they should go get them in the fall? 
so uniformly, my answer is that it's not a one size fits all. I know that sounds a little <laughs> bit funny, but you know, there's a there. You know, there are going to be groups that are absolutely going to be recommended: the elderly, immunocompromised, people with comorbidities, pregnant women. We will not have a vaccine against this BA 2.86 in a couple of weeks. Hence the real desire um, and and efforts to get a universal vaccine that we don't have to keep on switching, just like a universal flu vaccine. You know, we, we would love to get that as well. You know, again, we could end up in a month going, ugh, we're in trouble. The new vaccine's not going to cover it. We're seeing cases rise, but it could also just kind of quietly go away. So the answer is once it's available in a month, you talk to your doctor and see if it's something that's for you if yeah. you're otherwise not in that high risk group, Hallie. Real quick, as you're seeing, you know, this school down south try to get people to mask, um, Lionsgate, the movie studio, according to the LA Times, is also asking employees to mask up again. Do you think people are going to be able to take that seriously? I just wonder about that, right? I mean, the sort of m masking thing seems to have gone by the wayside for a lot of folks just anecdotally. Yeah, you know, you see them sort of sporadically around New York City now, and I and I, everyone who's wearing a mask right now, you're thinking they're either being cautious for themselves or for, or for someone in their family, right? I, I think it's going to be hard to, to ask folks voluntarily to mask up. I think we might see some mask mandates come back in public transportation and things like that. And listen, it's a tool that works. So, you know, I mean, we don't have to recreate the, the politicization of it. Um, you know, and probably that's here to stay. But I, I do think we're going to start seeing some more masking in the next couple of weeks, Hallie, especially as the flu and virus and winter season really yeah. comes upon us. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you. When we come back, a lot more to get to, including how a California man escaped death after flooding, washed his truck off a road, sweeping him miles away. Unreal. That's later in the local. Plus, Republican presidential candidates hitting their trail after their first debate and after Donald Trump's fourth arrest. And there's some interesting news tonight specifically related to these two. We're getting into it and why the KKK has been invoked. Coming up. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it'd be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southern Bureau, nearly 700 inmates were forced to evacuate after a fire at a Texas prison. Officials say the fire is still active, but it is under control at this point. Nobody was hurt, and all the inmates have been accounted for, according to prison officials. They're still trying to figure out what caused the fire. Also out of our Southern Bureau, a Florida school district is apologizing for an elementary school assembly that singled out black students. They were pulled out of class for a presentation on low test scores. School officials say the assembly was, I'm quoting here, a horrible, horrible mistake and that they do not support segregation. The school's principal is now on paid leave pending an investigation. And out of our Western Bureau, California man says he is lucky to be alive. And you know what? He sure is. Look at this. After flooding during Tropical Storm, Hillary swept him away in his car for six miles. I mean, look at that. He said it happened super suddenly. He ended up unconscious a few times. His car was stuck in the mud, but he says he was able to get out by grabbing onto trees nearby. Just an incredible story of survival there. To politics now with... Republican candidate Vivek Ramaswamy getting some pushback tonight in his first appearance on the campaign trail after that Republican primary debate for calling Democratic Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and author Ibram Kendi part of the modern KKK. Listen. I was just referring to a broader intellectual current in the modern left that reduces people to the color of their skin. And I think it's offensive. And I think the fact that we're taught to see one another on the basis of our genetic attributes is something that would make the old wizards of the Grand KKK proud. I think there's no better way to disempower somebody in this country as a kid than to say that you can't get ahead because of the genetics that you're born with. So Ramaswamy, of course, in the spotlight, but so is this candidate, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who's out there in Iowa as well mostly focusing on his own platform, a DeSantis-aligned super PAC today, confirming to NBC News that they're planning a $25 million ad buy in Iowa and New Hampshire. Dasha Burns is joining us now. A couple very different headlines here, right? Talk to us about this Iowa mm -hmm. split screen from these two. 
Yeah, Hallie, not the first time, by the way, that Vivek Ramaswamy has made controversial comments, especially when it comes to the issue of race on the campaign trail. And his a flyer that he passes out at all of his events, Truth for the Patriots of America, number four in his sort of list of ten commandments here is uh, reverse racism is racism. That's an issue that he does bring up uh, quite often on the trail. And he does speak about these things off the cuff. And so sometimes uh, he will say something that really stirs the pot, like you just heard there. And he is getting a lot of pushback on that comment. Uh, DeSantis, on the other hand, he really tries to stick to his talking points uh, when it comes to the issues. And that's what's so interesting. The two candidates that seem to come out on top from the debate, according to polling, like the new Washington Post poll that showed that those were the two uh, most successful performances from the debate stage. They are very different candidates. Vivek Ramaswamy came in pretty much unknown into uh, this race People didn't even know how to pronounce his name, and he still don't. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, on the other hand, had perhaps the most name ID next to, uh, next to Donald Trump. And Ramaswamy is a very rambunctious, fiery, off-the-cuff kind of speaker. At one of his events today that we were at, he did a stump speech for about 20 minutes, but then took questions from voters for about 45 minutes. Kind of the opposite of what DeSantis does at his events. But they are both in this state that is going to be so critical to them, all looming, of course, under the shadow of the former president. But they've got a little bit of momentum here, and we'll see if they're able to take advantage of it over the next uh, couple of days and weeks here, Hallie. Dasha Burns, live for us there in Iowa. Dasha, thank you. Coming up here on the show, big racial disparities among the kids who get admitted into New York City's elite public high schools, raising questions about the test that decides which kids get in. We're getting into some of it around those admissions decisions as part of our American Dream series tonight. Plus, an abducted woman saved by a stranger. How a note helped her get away from a fake rideshare driver next. An incredible story of survival tonight out of Arizona with a woman who saved herself from a kidnapper with some quick thinking. Police now revealing that after more than 24 hours tied up, and on the move with a rideshare driver, the victim managed to slip a note to a stranger to save her life. Here's Aaron Gilchrist with more. This is the post-it note with all the right details that brought a frightening kidnapping to a close. The sheriff's office in Yavapai County, Arizona, saying the victim handed it to a customer at a Chevron gas station Tuesday evening with these details. Call 911. This is my name. Here's my phone number with a description of the car she was at. The note also spelling out where the pair was headed, Kingman and Las Vegas. The gas station customer did the rest. The Good Samaritan was able to describe the van, was able to describe what the woman and the man she was with were wearing um, and what direction they were headed. Authorities releasing this image of a man and the blue van, the target of what would become an urgent search. State troopers spotting the car on the road to Vegas, ultimately arresting 41-year-old Jacob Wilhoit. The sheriff's office saying he snatched the victim from a car dealership early Monday morning, pretending to be a rideshare driver. She had called an Uber uh, down in the Phoenix area, and he was disguising himself in a wig and somehow ended up you know, taking her hostage, essentially, and zip-tying her hands. The sheriff's office says Will Hoyt and the woman spent a night at a park near Lake Mead before being busted. In the van, he had several guns in plain view. He's now being held without bail, accused of kidnapping, assault, and other charges. Efforts to reach him were unsuccessful, and the public defender's office wouldn't comment. It's not the first time a covert note has helped save a person in need. Back in 2021, an Orlando restaurant manager flashed this note to an 11-year-old boy. He looked distressed and bruised while dining with his family. The selfless act led to his parents being charged with neglect and abuse and his stepfather eventually getting life in prison. I don't feel like a hero and because to me, I just did what I supposed me to do. The victim in Arizona now back with family after taking her fate into her own hands. The extraordinary part of this, like I said, you have you have the, the victim and the Good Samaritan who both did what they were supposed to do. And because of that, this woman was home with her family. And, and thank goodness she is. Erin is joining us now. Some really extraordinary details there. Um, and you and I were talking, like, imagine seeing a note like that. You know, do you, do you take it seriously? You know, do you... 
what goes through your mind when you get something like that? Do we know anything else about, it sounds like it was a random attack. Do we know if these two knew each other? Yeah, it seems sort of random, but apparently they do know each other. We're not completely clear on how exactly that is the case. We know that uh, this young woman's mother called police to report her missing. That was on Monday morning. And when she called, she gave police this guy's name, Jacob wow. Wilhite's name, Hoyt's name uh, as a part of this report of a missing person, a missing endangered person. And that helped police to sort of connect some of the dots here. He's going to be in court. Uh, the end of next week. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. To our American Dream series now, where we talk about the promise of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness in this country and whether we're living up to it. And tonight, it's all about education on this back-to-school week. And now, after the Supreme Court's decision to strike down affirmative action in colleges, some admissions policies are in flux, with some asking if race can't be a factor, why not also leave out extracurriculars and grades? Leave it to a single test, maybe, instead. Well, that's exactly how it works for top public high schools in New York City. But not everybody's happy about it. Why? Because of the big racial disparity among the students that do get in. Ron Allen spoke with some of them and has more. Meet Jada Halsley. What's your favorite subject? Math. And Mariela Garcia Ramirez. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a neurosurgeon. When school starts in a couple of weeks, there'll be first-year students at Stuyvesant High, one of the most elite schools in New York City, one of eight so-called specialized public high schools ranked among the best anywhere in the country. But Jada and Mariella will be among a small percentage of black and Latino students offered admission to those elite schools again this year. Just 10% in a city where black and brown students make up more than two-thirds of all public school students. My middle school is mostly black and Latino, so I'm not, I don't know how I'm going to feel about not having people that share the same experiences as me. I don't have any problems with that. I just don't know what to expect. At Stuyvesant, the demographics are even more skewed. Of the 762 students offered admission, seven are black, 20 Latino, 158 white, and 489 Asian. The student makeup in the city's top public schools again raising questions about the admissions process based on a single three-hour standardized test. Just over 100 questions, math and English, students scoring highest get into the best schools. Why should a single test be the determining factor for who gets into the best schools in New York City? It is the most objective way to determine an admissions process. State Senator John Liu, a graduate of one of the elite schools himself, is a staunch defender of the process. It was created by the legislature in the 1970s with the goal of erasing unfair, subjective admissions policies to top schools. Over the years, critics who want the schools to better reflect the racial makeup of the city have proposed changes, but those have failed. Many in the Asian community feel besieged by this issue. And the only solutions offered have been demonstrated to decimate the Asian American opportunity for these schools. Why do you think this community does so well on the test? I think it's just academic preparation. And so the academic rigor that is demanded by many of the Asian parents, particularly the more recent immigrants, I think it's unparalleled. Admissions policies at the country's top universities under a new spotlight after the Supreme Court ruling banning affirmative action. Diversity, legacy, standardized testing, and extracurriculars all being heavily scrutinized. And it means more attention on the top high schools feeding those colleges as well. Many are private with opaque admissions policies. But in New York City, for thousands of top students in the public school system, it comes down to this test. I'm not against the test. I'm against these students not being prepared for it. Allison Schillingford runs Navigate the Maze, an academic enrichment program attended by students like Jada and Mariella trying to get into the city's most elite schools. And I don't blame the schools. We have 30, 25, 30 kids in this class. You think the solution is what? Finding students that can handle the work, who are highly motivated, that want to do it, and teach them the concepts. Students like Mariella, ready to start a new adventure in September. I will admit that there will be some, like, a, bar a barrier between me and the other students, but I don't really mind that. Do you think that's a barrier that you can overcome? Yeah, I feel like it's a barrier we can overcome. Ron Allen is joining us now. Fascinating reporting, Ron. How, if at all, does the Supreme Court's decision on affirmative action policies at colleges trickle down to these high schools? 
Well, supporters of the single admission tests process, like Senator Liu, who you heard from there, mm -hmm. uh, think that they are on the right side of the Supreme Court decision because they say this test is objective, it's it's unbiased, and, and it's, it's objective. Um, but on the other hand, there are opponents who still feel that the tests are inherently biased uh, and that they're unfair to students who, for example, don't have access to test prep or to academic enrichment programs, and they still are going to insist that uh, other criteria, student grades, extracurricular activities, interviews, essays, should be considered and would bring more diversity to these very, very elite schools. Allie? Elite indeed. Ron Allen, thank you so much. Really appreciate you doing this one. Still to come here on the show, Simone Biles has her eye on the next Olympics. After she dropped out of the last games in Tokyo, the next step on a road to Paris starts tonight. We'll talk about how important this weekend is for one of the greatest gymnasts of all time. Coming up. It's looking like the next step on the road to Paris for one of the greatest gymnasts of all time, Simone Biles. She's getting ready to compete in the U.S. championships tonight in what she's hoping will be a history-making return to glory. Remember, that's after she dropped out of the Tokyo Olympics last round. She got the twisties. That's what they call it. That's when you're in the air, you're getting disoriented during your tumbling. It can be really dangerous for somebody of Biles' caliber. Here's what she told the Today Show back then. I had no idea where I was in the air. You could literally see it in my eyes in the pictures. Like, I was petrified. So Biles is now hoping to make the national team headed to the Paris Games next year. The competition is going to be stiff, as NBC's Emily Aketa knows. But the competition, in some ways, is there because Simone Biles helped set a new bar, right, for what these gymnasts could do. I mean, she is so good. Is she not a shoe-in to make this team? Emily, help us understand it and what this competition tonight means. Well, I mean, she's called the GOAT for a good reason. Yeah. She really has lifted the level of gymnastics to a whole new place, and she's been the inspiration for so many people. But tonight is a massive deal for Simone and for all of the other athletes trying to make their way to Paris 2024. This is the U.S. Championships. It's a marquee event, and this influences who makes the national team, which in turn influences who makes worlds and com can compete in world, and that largely oftentimes is an indicator of who scores one of the five, just five coveted spots for Team USA heading to Paris 2024 uh, next year. But you think about it from the perspective of Simone Biles, you know, she just competed in her first event a few weeks ago since her two-year hiatus, as you mentioned, since competing in Tokyo, um, when she really took a step back to focus on her mental health. And there is fierce competition. This is actually the first U.S. championships where we are seeing not one, but two uh, a gold Olympian P uh, winners from previous Olympics competing at the same U.S. championship. So the caliber is going to be high. Take a listen here from a former Olympian herself. This competition is one where the pressure is a bit on. A year before the Games is something where that pressure can get to a lot of athletes, and we can see a lot of mistakes due to fear and anxiousness. This is the first competition. This weekend is the first first of many, where we need to see them ready, prepared, and excited to go. Mm. So the big question tonight is, will we see Simone Biles pull off the Yurchenko double pike? That is where she literally is flipping three times in the air off of the vault. It is something that she is the only one who, to, who ever has done it as a woman in competition. So all eyes will be, of course, on Simone Biles, Hallie. My, my brain can't even compute that. You know what I, I mean? Know, right? Like, I, I barely know how to fall down. Like, I mean, it's, it's incredible what she does. And it's also interesting when you look more broadly at U.S. gymnastics as a whole. Um, they have been through, I mean, listen, the sexual abuse scandals, widely known, widely covered. Some changes have been put in place here, right? They are also trying to enter a new era. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what says a lot is the number of gymnasts who took a step back and then are returning to the sport, like Simone Biles, like Gabby Douglas. Here are some of the changes USA Gymnastics has pointed to. Nearly 70 percent of their staff is new since 2018. They say that athletes have improved access to mental health resources, and they have been tracking their progress with regular anonymous surveys. Also, in terms of progression, $380 million settlement between uh, the victims since that uh, Larry Nassar sexual abuse case. Yeah. Larry Nassar, of course, now in jail. Emily Aketa, Emily, thank you so much. I know you will be watching tonight, so many people will be as well. Appreciate it. That's a wrap for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now.
coming on the air tonight with the latest out of Georgia, where we're about to turn the page to the next phase of the criminal case involving the former president, now that all of his co-defendants have been booked and processed. But it's only one mugshot making memes and money tonight. More on what happens next for Donald Trump live from Atlanta. Plus, developing tonight, deadly storms sweeping the Midwest, flooding towns, triggering tornadoes. We'll tell you where the warnings to come are landing in just a minute. Plus, breaking news out of Louisiana. Mandatory evacuations just lifted after a chemical leak at an oil refinery. Look at this. We're going to have the latest in a live report with the concerns over air quality. Plus, a man suspected of stalking Drew Barrymore is out of jail tonight after multiple incidents that officials say made the actress feel unsafe. The charges he's facing and what's being done to make sure it doesn't happen again. Then, in just the last couple hours, President Biden saying he's got a tentative plan to maybe help fight the spike in COVID cases with a new variant pushing some spots to mask up again. We'll get a gut check from one of our doctors later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight it is official. Every co-defendant of former President Donald Trump and Mr. Trump himself now turning themselves in to kick off what is the very beginning of a long road now lined with legal and political minefields. You see them here. This is it. Let me let you take it in here. All 19 people now charged and booked in this criminal case, accused of trying to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 election in Georgia. The last two people to surrender before the noon deadline today, Travian Cootie, the former publicist for Ye, the rapper formerly known as Kanye West, and Stephen Lee, a pastor based in Illinois. Already, this historic photo you're looking at, the first mugshot ever of a former president, is getting deployed on the campaign trail, leveraged as merch by Mr. Trump and his team. Think T-shirts, mugs, decals, koozies. But on the left, it's being used as evidence by Mr. Trump's critics to argue that an alleged criminal shouldn't be commander-in-chief. In all, in this case and in the three others he's facing, he's looking at 91 charges. And in one of those cases, the federal election interference case, there's a key hearing on Monday where we may find out a trial date for him as the campaign calendar continues to collide with the courts. I want to bring in Vaughn Hilliard, who's live on the ground for us in Atlanta tonight. There's a lot of, we're sort of getting into the phase of this, Vaughn, where there's like incremental legal stuff happening almost every couple hours, right? right? Like lots of filings, lots of procedural stuff. But the next kind of key moment is going to be an arraignment for Donald Trump in Georgia. He may not have to be in Georgia for that, right? Explain that. Right. September 5th is the week that is after Labor Day that the district attorney has ordered uh, Donald Trump and each of the other 18 defendants to go through their formal arraignments. That's when Donald Trump would be able to enter his not guilty plea. But here in the state of Georgia, there are arraignment waivers available. So there may be a scenario that there may be many months in which Donald Trump, before he comes back to Georgia again, he may also virtually appear. So that's sort of outstanding. But there's going to be, you said it, a lot of filings, a lot of motions between now and then just yesterday afternoon his attorney put in one objecting to a speedy trial this is a, a, a defendant Donald Trump who does not want his trial to begin until after the 2024 election and when you look at the schedule the legal one and the political one Hallie well it is messy and it's complicated and it runs right all into each other because it's not just the trial stemming from those four criminal cases but also this year he has the Trump uh, organization they have their civil suit coming from the New York Attorney General's office you have in January, the E. Jean Carroll defamation civil trial to that is will move forward. So for Donald Trump, there is a, a, a lot of legal peril that is running and coinciding directly with the Iowa caucus, New Hampshire primary, Super Tuesday. It all is tangled together. What is next in your reporter's notebook, Vaughn? In other words, what's the thread that you're pulling on in the next couple of weeks here? What's the most important thing um, that you're looking for that we should be looking for? Frustration with Donald Trump from within the Republican hmm. Party. You saw these key Republican rivals up on the debate stage, uh, you know, they kind of take some swings at Donald Trump, suggesting to voters that they need to move in a different direction. 2024, they can't be burdened by, you know, legal trials that Donald Trump is going through if he, in fact, is the nominee. But at what point do some of these co-defendants uh, become publicly frustrated by the lack of financial support from Donald Trump and allies? Because we know that they are hurting for funds. We've already 
already heard from some of them that have asked for financial support. Uh, several of these so-called fake electors have said that they acted on uh, the direction of Donald Trump's campaign. And so at what point do, does the Republican Party apparatus and some of its notable elected leaders, governors and others uh, in some of these key states stand up and say, you know, Donald Trump is bringing the Republican Party down because right now in polling, he looks like the clear front runner and favorite to win the GOP nomination again. But could these trials uh, that are pending in front of him really become a political burden that finally some in the Republican Party, despite not saying it for eight years, say enough is enough. The Republican Party needs to move in a new direction. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you so much. Live for us there in Atlanta. Much more for you to come, I know, in the next few weeks. To a one-two punch of extreme weather now with 85 million people under heat alerts today. With double trouble in the Midwest, dealing with those deadly storms and the recovery from it. You can see the damage here. I mean, those streets flooded out, deep, deep puddles, cars trying to get through. In Michigan, at least five people, including a woman and two little girls, were killed with high and violent winds blowing through. Ten tornadoes have been confirmed. Something like half a million people still do not have power in Michigan or in Ohio. You saw trees totally uprooted, taking some of the ground with it. And it doesn't end there. With a new tropical storm churning, it could become a hurricane by Sunday and maybe threaten Florida next week. I want to bring in Maggie Vespa. And Maggie, this has been a summer of extreme weather. It has turned deadly yet again in the Midwest with more on the way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, Holly. I mean, at this point, it's like, you know, which natural disaster do we want to talk about? And are we keeping track of them properly? Like, we were in Michigan yesterday, as you know, covering the flash floods that had occurred two nights ago. And then last night, parts of that same, uh, the same parts of that state, at least in some cases, also hit now with these tornadoes. Ten confirmed, as you said. We just got that last confirmation, that tenth, in the last 20 minutes. Surveyors with the National Weather Service are out surveying the damage. And basically, they have a lot to comb through. We're talking about massive massive pileups on the interstate. One person dead in that. Another car crash, the one that you talked about, with a woman and two little girls killed in that. A tree falling on a house. This is mostly in the Lansing and Grand Rapids area. One person killed when the tree came crashing into that home. And when you see the size of the trees that we're talking about, the kinds of trees that are toppling, being ripped up by their roots, you kind of get why this situation is so catastrophic. Take a look, Kelly. This is the most intense storm I've ever witnessed in my life. It was pretty scary there for about a half hour there, not knowing what was going on. You see that guy just standing next to the tree that fell outside his house. You know, it was really interesting. Earlier today, uh, officials in multiple counties in Michigan got together. They had a press conference, and they announced, and we kind of expect things like this, unfortunately, when natural disasters happen. They announced that there was a state of emergency in at least two Michigan counties, but they were talking about a state of emergency to help people recover from the floods. It was almost like they were one natural disaster behind, if that makes sense. At that pre-planned yeah. press conference, they kind of had to wing it and talk about the tornadoes that had now hit hit overnight that are deadly. And as we said, they are still combing through the wreckage. Hallie. Maggie Vespa, live for us there in the Midwest. Maggie, thank you. To Maui now, where we're learning more about one of the biggest problems that exists at the moment. All of the people, thousands of them, displaced when their homes burnt down, maybe having no place to go soon. The clock is ticking with our NBC News team on the ground, talking with folks who have lost loved ones, lost family members, and now saying they're furious because they say FEMA and the government are only giving them a couple more weeks of housing. Listen. None of us have time to grieve. When you have to worry about where you're going to live, how can you even have time to grieve? How can you plan a funeral? How can you anything? It comes as officials release the names of the nearly 400 people still missing more than two weeks after that devastating firestorm incinerated the historic town of Lahaina. At least 115 people have been confirmed dead. And as we've been saying now, nearly since the moment this, this fire happened, that number could keep going up. Sam Brock knows it. He's on the ground now for us, live on the island of Maui. And we're just getting a new update from the governor there about these housing concerns. You just spoke with him. People are furious. They're like, where are we supposed to go as they're trying to begin to start thinking about rebuilding their lives? And the governor, Hallie, has said, we got your back. So we'll mm. delve into his plan. But really, the issue here from the beginning was the fact that you had 5,500 people 
who had to be relocated either into hotels or Airbnbs. And many of them that I spoke with were concerned that when they have three weeks left on their assistance and so that runs up, that they have nowhere else to go. Here's what I think the source of the concern was. What the governor said is that they have basically 36 weeks or nine months of guaranteed housing in hotels. Now, some of those people I talked to ended up in Airbnbs. Airbnb had volunteered some 100 units or so. Those were actually three weeks. But for everybody else, they can stay where they are. And for the ones in Airbnbs, they can move to hotels. Part of the problem as well is the fact that you have to renew. It doesn't automatically happen. Those displaced residents and families have to ask the Red Cross, be registered with them and ask them to extend another 30 days. So I just spoke with the governor. He said he is guaranteeing that that plan of action will be put forward. Here's part of our conversation. We intend to have a plan ready in the coming days to show people that they'll have this first essential six months covered, and then we're going to extend for the better part of 18 months. Is that a promise that you're making to residents? Yes, it's a commitment. And Hallie, the reality is there were no rental units available in Maui or in Lahaina to begin with. This is a very expensive, very popular area to live, much like other parts of the United States where you see this housing crunch. It's true here as well. So these folks were just wondering, where would we go anyway? But the hotels have really right. stepped up. And right now that appears to be the short term solution. The other piece of news coming out of Maui tonight is this new list, 388 people not accounted for. This number is down from the 1,100, 1,000 people that we thought that we had heard from officials earlier yeah. in the week. Um, it is significant because it really is the first confirmation of names, identities of, of, of people where they don't know where they are. Exactly. Let's say up front, there's been so much fluctuation yeah. on this point, yeah. Hallie, that everyone has been confused. So you are not alone on that. The 388 right now, according to the FBI in Maui County, has certain qualifiers. It means that person has a first name, a last name that was submitted, and also a point of contact to reach another loved one or relative or friend. And so that's how they sort of filtered it out and got 388 from 1,054 as of yesterday. So that is at least trending in the right direction, certainly. But there was also some tragic news that we learned today, too, that a seven-year-old boy, Tony Takafua, who was with several of his relatives in a car trying to escape the flames, was confirmed as a victim. So now we know that there was at least one child, probably many more, but at this point, at least one, tragically, who died in this fire, Hallie. It is just uh, a, a gut punch every time we talk about it, even more so tonight. Sam Brock, thank you so much for that live yeah. report. Let's take you overseas now, where Russian President Vladimir Putin is signing an order late tonight that forces all the mercenaries in that country to pledge allegiance to Russia and the Kremlin. That says there are new questions tonight about what caused that plane crash that supposedly killed the head of the mercenary group who marched on Moscow a couple months ago in an attempted coup. The Kremlin today says, hey, it wasn't us, calling speculation that Putin himself ordered a hit on Prigozhin an absolute lie in their words. Come says we're getting some new video of the wreckage showing the wing from the plane apparently miles away from the rest of the crash site. Russian investigators also say they found the flight recorder, that black box basically, at the site. No official confirmation yet that Prigozhin's body has been found or identified. We still do not know what took the plane down. Josh Letterman is joining us now. So, Josh, let's talk about the idea of Putin looking to consolidate his power and the Kremlin denying they had anything to do with Prigozhin's death. It seems the mystery, I should say, Prigozhin's alleged death, right, his uh, apparent death at this point, since there has been no official confirmation. It's been a mystery as to what happened to this plane, and it's a mystery that, that may never be solved. It probably will never be solved in any way that feels satisfying to those of us who want facts, who want to know exactly what happened here. What we're likely to see, Hallie, is uh, the Kremlin continue to deny any involvement, uh, some type of results of an investigation uh, that is now ongoing, uh, where they come up with some explanation uh, that is not particularly satisfying to those in the West and Western intelligence officials, those in the U.S. and elsewhere, saying that they believe that this was sabotage, which is what the U.S. Uh, is currently saying, uh, and the likely person behind it, Vladimir Putin. Because when you talk about consolidating power and that move today to try to force these Wagner fighters to pledge allegiance to Russia, this is something Putin has wanted for
for months now, even before that attempted mutiny by Prigozhin, when he wanted all of the Wagner fighters who were getting, in his view, a little too big for their britches. You had Prigozhin publicly denouncing the Russian military, calling them incompetent. He wanted them all to sign military contracts to come underneath the control of the Kremlin. Prigozhin at the time said, no way. And we believe that is one of the main reasons he attempted that mutiny against uh, Putin. And here we are two months later, Prigozhin is dead. Putin once again moving to bring his fighters under Kremlin control. There's also this sort of interesting thread that has been unraveled out of Belarus here, where state media is saying that the president there, Alexander Lukashenko, tipped off Prigozhin about an assassination plot back in January. Help us understand the timing of that if the march on Moscow, that attempted coup, wasn't until June. To be totally honest, the Belarusian angle of this whole story has been bizarre and confounding. <laughs> the whole way for through. Months, You're totally right. Since... Like the whole way, yes. The Belarusian leader, Lukashenko, popping up as this mediator uh, when they, we had that attempted coup. And then suddenly, uh, the, the Wagner leader, Prigozhin, was going to be in Belarus with all of his fighters. Then suddenly, he wasn't in Belarus. He was in Russia. And now, Lukashenko saying that he tipped off uh, Prigozhin to an attempted assassination uh, months ago, even before that attempted mutiny. Now, it doesn't appear he's talking about uh, a, a potential assassination by the Russians because he, in fact, sent that message to. Prigozhin through the Kremlin as the intermediary. But this is just one more way that the Belarusian angle of this is really confusing people in Russia and in the West, Hallie. Josh Letterman, thank you very much. We've got some breaking news now to get to out of Louisiana, where a mandatory evacuation order has just been lifted for a town west of New Orleans. That's after a refinery fire there. Look at some of these images. You can see those thick clouds of black smoke. Bright orange flames. Emergency crews responded to this fire and chemical leak at a storage tank at Marathon Petroleum's refinery in Garyville. Marathon says the fire and the chemical release are contained on its property. Nobody was hurt, fortunately. But everybody who lives and works and goes to school in a two-mile radius of the refinery had to be evacuated. Cassie Sherm with our affiliate WDSU is joining us from Garyville. Cassie, it's good to see you. So good news that the evacuation order has been lifted, but this looks pretty serious. What else do we know? How's the air quality? <laughs> That's right, Hallie. Now, one of the things is, is the air quality here is still a big concern because you guys were looking at that video and the pictures of what this area looked like about a couple hours ago, completely filled with smoke, with hazardous material. And you can see back behind me here, it's clear, but it's still hazy from what's being left. Now, take a look at the video from earlier. You can see that dark cloud of smoke coming from Marathon Petroleum and even flames, as officials say, a chemical release caused the very large fire around 7 o'clock, which is still under investigation. Now, it prompted a mandatory evacuation for everyone in that two-mile radius. Like you said, more than 8,000 people were evacuated in that two-mile area. The burning material, it's naphtha. It's a liquid hydrocarbon mixture used as a component to make gasoline. Now, naphtha is considered a hazardous material by the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the parish conducted an air quality test near this site, and they've been doing this previously as well, but we're still waiting to hear from those results. Now, this isn't the first time crews have responded to a fire at Marathon Patrol refinery. There's been at least three fires in the last two years, and two of them have had major injuries. Now, we're very fortunate in this situation that there were no injuries. And I mean, one of the biggest things is they say they have, when it comes to this, they have plays and they have things to do when it comes to the fire. So they have plans in place to try to stop things like this from happening. But we're going to continue to follow this, and hopefully this doesn't happen again. Reporting here from Garysville, I'm Cassie Sherm. Back to you. Cassie, thank you so much. It's great to see you there from our affiliate WDSU. Appreciate it. Fed Chair Jay Powell today saying inflation is still too high and warning more rate hikes could be on the way. You know the Fed is determined to try to get inflation down to about 2%. Right now it's sitting at 3.2, so a little higher than what the Fed wants to see. That's why there's this preview of potential interest rate hikes. So what does that mean? Well, it could mean higher rates for mortgage loans in the middle of what is the most unaffordable housing market in decades. In the midst of, of it all, you've got Zillow, that real estate marketplace, trying to gin up some business, offering mortgages with a 1% down payment, 1%.
CNBC's Steve Lisman is joining us now from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where Powell is making these remarks that obviously, Steve, have Wall Street watching, have Main Street watching. There had been some discussion, right, as these fears of a recession have somewhat abated, at least for now, that perhaps Jay Powell might keep rates kind of kind of steady for a bit. That was not the signal we're getting today. Why does it matter to the average Joe? Well, it matters to the average, Joe, because rates could go higher. I'm not sure it's a done deal. Um, what he sort of laid out was some criteria that he's looking for. He wants inflation to come down. The Fed has a 2 percent target. Um, and there may be some pressure on inflation this month when it comes to uh, higher oil prices and even some higher food prices. So he was sort of skeptical that the recent decline in inflation, he was kind of like a, a Missourian and show me that this is going to last when it comes to uh, inflation coming down. The economy is running pretty hot, and the Fed's idea of how to bring inflation down is to loosen up the economy, loosen up the job market, and that'll create excess in the economy that will help bring down prices. That hasn't happened, even though inflation's come down. So um, I, I think we don't have to worry about interest rates going higher next month. It's really more November when they could go up a quarter point. But bottom line is I would not, if I was sitting there waiting for rates to come down uh, uh, to do something, expect it to come down real soon. Mortgage rates could come down a little bit because they're a little high even relative to where the Fed is. But I don't think a whole lot of relief is coming here. So now you've got Zillow, Steve, everybody's favorite, uh, you know, browse and fantasize site. Well, <laughs> maybe, you know, coming out real, real, from a real estate perspective, saying they're going to offer maybe 1% down. Um, what's the deal there, right? Because that, I can imagine, might seem really appealing to somebody who's looking at these mortgage rates going, well, wait a second, they're the highest they've been in a couple of decades here. I can't swing that for 20% down, but maybe I can for far less. Well, that's a real sign of the times, as you talked about, housing affordability has not gone the way of the average Joe, as you said. Um, it, it's with mortgage rates high and housing prices still high. This is the real conundrum we find ourselves in, that the interest rates have gone higher, but the housing market hasn't really cooled that much. Fed Chair Jay Powell even talked about the idea that housing's picking back up, and I think it comes from, Haley, what's been going on for 10 years. We've been underbuilding housing in this country. You also have the pandemic, which created the it's premium for certain kinds of housing where people wanted to live. So it's not any easier right now. And what Zillow's doing is a sign of the times. And people should just be very careful what they get themselves into with those kind of financial arrangements. Yeah, no kidding. Steve Leisman, not a green screen behind you, right? Just a fact check. That's really the Tetons there? No, that's the real thing. That's the real thing. No, that's, uh, those are actual mountains. You and the bison, my friend. Thank you, Steve. I'm jealous of that view. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for walking us through it. Right now, auto workers are hitting practice picket lines in different places around the country after a vote to authorize a strike if talks with the three big car makers in this country break down. Here's President Biden on this not too long ago. Obviously, I'm concerned. I think that there should be a circumstance where the jobs that are being displaced and placed with new jobs, they should go to the first choice, should go to the UAW members who had the job. And the salary should be commensurate. The UAW says more than 150,000 of its workers are ready to walk off the job in the next few weeks, depending on how negotiations go. The workers are asking Ford, GM, and Stellantis, formerly known as Chrysler, for more money, a nearly 50% pay raise, for a 32-hour full-time work week, and for better benefits, like expanded pensions. If there were to be a strike, and remember, that's not a done deal yet. Experts put the loss at $5 billion in just 10 days. Long term, it could mean more expensive new cars for people who are looking to buy one. we got a lot more to get to coming up here in the show, including some deja vu in Italy tonight after tourists were caught vandalizing yet another piece of architecture. People, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what was spray painted on like something that's nearly 500 years old later this hour. Plus... One family in Florida saying they weren't sure why they were getting sick until a video caught what a neighbor was injecting under their door. You've got to see this one coming up. A man accused of stalking Drew Barrymore multiple times is under orders now from a judge to wear an ankle monitor and stay away from her after police arrested him overnight. This is the same man who crashed an onstage panel that she was hosting in New York City earlier this week. Watch this. I'm Chad Michael Busto, you know who I am. I need to see you at some point while I'm here in New York City. Okay? 
So you see Drew Barrymore and actress Renee Rapp, who she was with, both get up. They immediately walk off stage after the man said, hey, I need to see you. Security escorts him out. The criminal complaint we got today says this incident showed the man's history of making unwanted advances, as they describe it, towards Barrymore. Police didn't arrest him until last night after he was apparently riding a bike up into private driveways in Barry's Moore neighbor and uh, around sort of the area asking for Drew Barrymore's house. He was looking for where she lived. Kristen Dahlgren is joining us now. So this person is now out of jail. He's expected back in court next month. Bring us up to speed. Right, so we're talking about 43-year-old Chad Michael Busto. Uh, he's from Washington, D.C. He was arraigned in Southampton this morning uh, on charges of misdemeanor stalking in the fourth degree. That's a uh, Class B misdemeanor punishable by up to three months in prison and up to a $500 fine. Uh, as you said, you know, the judge ordered that he stay away from Barrymore now and that he wear an ankle monitor uh, for the next 60 days to, to keep track of his location. He'll be back in court on September 12th. Uh, you know, Barrymore said that she isn't going to let this uh, change the way she does anything, but he is out tonight, Hallie. Kristen Dahlgren, thank you very much for that update. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Rite Aid is getting ready to file for bankruptcy in the next few weeks to address thousands of lawsuits they're facing over its alleged role in the opioid epidemic, according to the Wall Street Journal. The filing would reportedly cover Rite Aid's $3 billion debt, along with some pending legal issues over allegations it oversupplied prescription painkillers. A Rite Aid rep did not respond to requests for comment. Number two, officials in Northern California are trying to figure out why people got rashes and why they started vomiting and getting fevers after competing in that tough mudder race last weekend. For now, the working theory is that maybe it was caused by a bacteria in the water on that muddy obstacle course. A tough mudder spokesperson said the health and safety of people who compete in those races is a top priority. Number three, a man in Tampa arrested and charged with multiple felonies after, look at this, getting captured on camera appearing to take out a syringe, fill it with liquid, and inject it under his neighbor's door. The person who lives there said he got suspicious when he, his wife, their baby started feeling sick and smelling chemicals. Our Miami station reports that according to a police affidavit, a hazmat test found that the liquid had opioid pain medications in it. In a statement to our Tampa affiliate, the suspect's attorney said he pleaded not guilty. Number four, the director of a British museum has resigned more than a week after it fired a staff member for allegedly stealing or damaging hundreds of artifacts. The director said the museum did not handle theft warnings well enough and that the blame ultimately rests on his shoulders. That's at the British Museum. Number five, it may be time to say bye to the just very, very popular pandas at DC's National Zoo come December. They're apparently going back to China when the research exchange program that brought them here expires. As of now, the zoo hasn't said when or if a new set of pandas will come. People love the pandas. Keep the pandas at the zoo. That's what, that's what people, many people are saying. <laughs> Some new concerns tonight now about a new variant that may be able to get around the things we do to protect us from COVID. And it's partly why some places are starting to mask up again, or at least asking people to do that. Scientists say they're watching this new variant since it seems to be able to get around the antibodies that protect us from getting sick, even for people who are vaccinated or who have recently had other kinds of COVID, other variants. There have been a few cases here and around the world. The data coming in is enough for some spots to try to get people thinking about protecting themselves from COVID again. One school in Atlanta is reinstating its mask policy. President Biden talking about this from his vacation in Tahoe, saying his administration will try to help. Listen. I signed off this morning on a proposal we have to present to the Congress a request for additional funding for new vaccine that is necessary, that works. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar is joining us now. So, Dr. Natalie, there have been a lot of variants. We've seen a lot of them come and go since the beginning of the pandemic. What makes this one different and of special concern? 
Yeah, and you know, this is how I frame it, Hallie, is that viruses mutate for a living. This is what they do. They're always trying to become more contagious, but they're not necessarily trying to become more severe because they want to survive also. So we know that we've been talking about hospitalizations creeping up in the last couple of weeks. It's not thought to be due to this particular variant, the BA 2.86. We actually don't know how contagious it is or if it really will cause more severe disease. But this is why experts are so concerned. We do think that it's going to dodge immunity from vaccines as well as previous infections. It's a distant relative from that original Omicron, but it's got a ton of mutations, over 30 mutations in the spike and other parts of the virus that are really going to make it difficult for any vaccine, including the new one coming up, to really protect us. Tests should still work, those rapid antigen PCRs, and Paxlovid should still work the antiviral. But nonetheless, this definitely has experts around the world really watching very, very closely. But so what advice are you giving people who are asking you about boosters, if they should go get them in the fall? Uh, so uniformly, my answer is that it's not a one size fits all. I know that sounds a little <laughs> bit funny, but you know, there's a, there, you know, there are going to be groups that are absolutely going to be recommended. The elderly, immunocompromised, people with comorbidities, pregnant women. We will not have a vaccine against this BA 2.86 in a couple of weeks. Hence the real desire um, and, and efforts to get a universal vaccine that we don't have to keep on switching, just like a universal flu vaccine. You know, we, we would love to get that as well. You know, again, we could end up in a month going, ugh, we're in trouble. The new vaccine's not going to cover it. We're seeing cases rise, but it could also just kind of quietly go away. So the answer is once it's available in a month, you talk to your doctor and see if it's something that's for you if yeah. you're otherwise not in that high risk group, Hallie. Real quick, as you're seeing, you know, this school down south try to get people to mask, um, Lionsgate, the movie studio, according to the LA Times, is also asking employees to mask up again. Do you think people are going to be able to take that seriously? I just wonder about that, right? I mean, the sort of m masking thing seems to have gone by the wayside for a lot of folks just anecdotally. Yeah, you know, you see them sort of sporadically around New York City now. And I and I, everyone who's wearing a mask right now, you're thinking they're either being cautious for themselves or for, for someone in their family, right? I, I think it's going to be hard to, to ask folks voluntarily to mask up. I think we might see some mask mandates come back in public transportation and things like that. And listen, it's a tool that works. So, you know, I mean, we don't have to recreate the, the politicization of it, um, you know, and probably that's here to stay. But I, I do think we're we're going to start seeing some more masking in the next couple of weeks, Hallie, especially as the flu and virus and winter season really yeah. comes upon us. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you. When we come back, new details tonight from Spain's soccer team after that kiss that seems to have been heard around the world after the Women's World Cup. What the team members are now threatening next, plus a flight in Myanmar arriving with one more passenger than it left with. We'll explain in the global. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. This is some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Myanmar, a plane landing with one more passenger than it left with after a woman gave birth mid-flight. Apparently no doctors on board. But you can see here passengers stepping in. They're offering their clothes. They're helping deliver this baby girl. Happened about 20 minutes after takeoff. Mom and baby were sent to the hospital after the plane landed. They are reported to be healthy, thank goodness. Out of Italy, police are looking for the German tourists who allegedly vandalized a 500-plus-year-old piece of architecture in Florence. Local media reports those numbers spray-painted on the columns are a reference to a German soccer club. Come on, people. Like, really? The city's mayor is promising a full investigation. What a bummer. Out of Spain. The country's women's soccer team says they will not play until the Spanish soccer president steps down. They want him out after he kissed a player on the lips after their World Cup win. He so far is refusing to resign despite the pressure to do so. Tonight, we are learning one of the now highest profile Republican candidates in the 2024 presidential race, not named Donald Trump, has not voted in a GOP primary recently enough to actually be affiliated with that party, according to his home state's voting records. Vivek Ramaswamy is listed as unaffiliated in Franklin, Ohio, since November 2021. It's coming as he's getting some pushback tonight after calling Democratic Congresswoman Ayanna Presley 
and author Ibram Kendi, part of the modern KKK. Listen. I was just referring to a broader intellectual current in the modern left that reduces people to the color of their skin. And I think it's offensive. And I think the fact that we're taught to see one another on the basis of our genetic attributes is something that would make the old wizards of the Grand KKK proud. I think there's no better way to disempower somebody in this country as a kid than to say that you can't get ahead because of the genetics that you're born with. Ramaswamy, of course, got a lot of attention after the debate earlier this week. So did this candidate, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who is also out in Iowa trying to get back some momentum after slumping in the polls a bit. Another move to get some attention back on the governor, a DeSantis-aligned super PAC is putting some big money into TV ads in two key states, Iowa and New Hampshire. Dasha Burns is joining us now. A couple very different headlines here, right? Talk to us about this Iowa mm -hmm. split screen from these two. Yeah, Hallie, not the first time, by the way, that Vivek Ramaswamy has made controversial comments, especially when it comes to the issue of race on the campaign trail. And his a flyer that he passes out at all of his events, Truth for the Patriots of America, number four in his sort of list of ten commandments here is uh, reverse racism is racism. That's an issue that he does bring up uh, quite often on the trail. And he does speak about these things off the cuff. And so sometimes uh, he will say something that really stirs the pot, like you just heard there. And he is getting a lot of pushback on that comment. Uh, DeSantis, on the other hand, he really tries to stick to his talking points uh, when it comes to the issues, and that's what's so interesting. The two candidates that seem to come out on top from the debate, according to polling, like the new Washington Post poll that showed that those were the two uh, most successful performances from the debate stage, they are very different candidates. Vivek Ramaswamy came in pretty much unknown into uh, this race. People didn't even know how to pronounce his name, and he still don't. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, on the other hand, had perhaps the most name ID next to, uh, next to Donald Trump. And Ramaswamy is a very rambunctious, fiery, off-the-cuff kind of speaker. At one of his events today that we were at, he did a stump speech for about 20 minutes, but then took questions from voters for about 45 minutes. Kind of the opposite of what DeSantis does at his events. But they are both in this state that is going to be so critical to them, all looming, of course, under the shadow of the former president. But They've got a little bit of momentum here, and we'll see if they're able to take advantage of it over the next uh, couple of days and weeks here, Hallie. Dasha Burns, live for us there in Iowa. Dasha, thank you. Coming up here on the show, big racial disparities among the kids who get admitted into New York City's elite public high schools, raising questions about the test that decides which kids get in. We're getting into some of it around those admissions decisions as part of our American Dream series tonight. Plus, an abducted woman saved by a stranger. How a note helped her get away from a fake rideshare driver next. An incredible story of survival tonight out of Arizona with a woman who saved herself from a kidnapper with some quick thinking. Police now revealing that after more than 24 hours tied up, and on the move with a rideshare driver, the victim managed to slip a note to a stranger to save her life. Here's Aaron Gilchrist with more. This is the post-it note with all the right details that brought a frightening kidnapping to a close. The sheriff's office in Yavapai County, Arizona, saying the victim handed it to a customer at a Chevron gas station Tuesday evening with these details. Call 911. This is my name. Here's my phone number with a description of the car she was at. The note also spelling out where the pair was headed, Kingman and Las Vegas. The gas station customer did the rest. The Good Samaritan was able to describe the van, was able to describe what the woman and the man she was with were wearing. Um, and what direction they were headed. Authorities releasing this image of a man and the blue van, the target of what would become an urgent search. State troopers spotting the car on the road to Vegas, ultimately arresting 41-year-old Jacob Wilhoit. The sheriff's office saying he snatched the victim from a car dealership early Monday morning, pretending to be a rideshare driver. She had called an Uber uh, down in the Phoenix area, and he was disguising himself in a wig, and somehow ended up, you know, taking her 
hostage, essentially, and zip tying her hands. The sheriff's office says Will Hoyt and the woman spent a night at a park near Lake Mead before being busted. In the van, he had several guns in plain view. He's now being held without bail, accused of kidnapping, assault, and other charges. Efforts to reach him were unsuccessful, and the public defender's office wouldn't comment. It's not the first time a covert note has helped save a person in need. Back in 2021, an Orlando restaurant manager flashed this note to an 11-year-old boy. He looked distressed and bruised while dining with his family. The selfless act led to his parents being charged with neglect and abuse, and his stepfather eventually getting life in prison. I don't feel like a hero, and because to me, I just did what I supposed me to do. The victim in Arizona now back with family after taking her fate into her own hands. The extraordinary part of this, like I said, you have you have the, the victim and the Good Samaritan who both did what they were supposed to do. And because of that, this woman was home with her family. And, and thank goodness she is. Erin is joining us now. Some really extraordinary details there. Um, and you and I were talking, like, imagine seeing a note like that. You know, do you, do you take it seriously? You know, do you, what goes through your mind when you get something like that? Do we know anything else about, it sounds like it was a random attack. Do we know if these two knew each other? Yeah, it seems sort of random, but apparently they do know each other. We're not completely clear on how exactly that is the case. We know that uh, this young woman's mother called police to report her missing. That was on Monday morning. And when she called, she gave police this guy's name, Jacob wow. Wilhite's name, Hoyt's name, uh, as a part of this report of a missing person, a uh, missing endangered person. And that helped police to sort of connect some of the dots here. He's going to be in court uh, the end of next week. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. To our American Dream series now, where we talk about the promise of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness in this country and whether we're living up to it. And tonight, it's all about education on this back to school week. And now, after the Supreme Court's decision to strike down affirmative action in colleges, some admissions policies are in flux, with some asking if race can't be a factor, why not also leave out extracurriculars and grades? Leave it to a single test, maybe instead. Well, that's exactly how it works for top public high schools in New York City. But not everybody's happy about it. Why? Because of the big racial disparity among the students that do get in. Ron Allen spoke with some of them and has more. Meet Jada Halsley. What's your favorite subject? Math. And Mariela Garcia Ramirez. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a neurosurgeon. When school starts in a couple of weeks, they'll be first-year students at Stuyvesant High, one of the most elite schools in New York City, one of eight so-called specialized public high schools ranked among the best anywhere in the country. But Jada and Mariela will be among a small percentage of black and Latino students offered admission to those elite schools again this year. Just 10% in a city where black and brown students make up more than two-thirds of all public school students. My middle school is mostly black and Latino, so I'm not, I don't know how I'm going to feel about not having people that share the same experiences as me. I don't have any problems with that. I just don't know what to expect. At Stuyvesant, the demographics are even more skewed. Of the 762 students offered admission, seven are black, 20 Latino, 158 white, and 489 Asian. The student makeup in the city's top public schools again raising questions about the admissions process based on a single three-hour standardized test. Just over 100 questions, math and English, students scoring highest get into the best schools. Why should a single test be the determining factor for who gets into the best schools in New York City? It is the most objective way to determine an admissions process. State Senator John Liu, a graduate of one of the elite schools himself, is a staunch defender of the process. It was created by the legislature in the 1970s with the goal of erasing unfair, subjective admissions policies to top schools. Over the years, critics who want the schools to better reflect the racial makeup of the city have proposed changes, but those have failed. Many in the Asian community feel besieged by this issue. And the only solutions offered have been demonstrated to decimate the Asian American opportunity for these schools. Why do you think this community does so well on the test? I think it's just academic preparation. And so the academic rigor that is demanded by many of the Asian parents, particularly the more recent immigrants, I think it's unparalleled. 
Admissions policies at the country's top universities under a new spotlight after the Supreme Court ruling banning affirmative action. Diversity, legacy, standardized testing, and extracurriculars all being heavily scrutinized. And it means more attention on the top high schools feeding those colleges as well. Many are private with opaque admissions policies. But in New York City, for thousands of top students in the public school system, it comes down to this test. I'm not against the test. I'm against these students not being prepared for it. Allison Schillingford runs Navigate the Maze, an academic enrichment program attended by students like Jada and Mariella trying to get into the city's most elite schools. And I don't blame the schools. We have 30, 25, 30 kids in this class. Do you think the solution is what? Finding students that can handle the work, who are highly motivated, that want to do it, and teach them the concepts. Students like Mariella, ready to start a new adventure in September. I will admit that there will be some like a, bar a barrier between me and the other students, but I don't really mind that. Do you think that's a barrier that you can overcome? Yeah, I feel like it's a barrier we can overcome. Ron Allen is joining us now. Fascinating reporting, Ron. How, if at all, does the Supreme Court's decision on affirmative action policies at colleges trickle down to these high schools? Well, supporters of the single admission test process, like Senator Liu, who you heard from there, mm -hmm. uh, think that they are on the right side of the Supreme Court decision because they say this test is objective, it's, it's unbiased, and, and it's, it's objective. Um, but on the other hand, there are opponents who still feel that the tests are inherently biased uh, and that they're unfair to students who, for example, don't have access to test prep or to academic enrichment programs, and they still are going to insist that uh, other criteria, student grades, extracurricular activities, Activities, interviews, essays should be considered and would bring more diversity to these very, very elite schools. Allie? Elite indeed. Ron Allen, thank you so much. Really appreciate you doing this one. Still to come here on the show, Simone Biles has her eye on the next Olympics. After she dropped out of the last games in Tokyo, the next step on a road to Paris starts tonight. We'll talk about how important this weekend is for one of the greatest gymnasts of all time. Coming up. It's looking like the next step on the road to Paris for one of the greatest gymnasts of all time, Simone Biles. She's getting ready to compete in the U.S. championships tonight and what she's hoping will be a history-making return to glory. Remember, that's after she dropped out of the Tokyo Olympics last round. She got the twisties. That's what they call it. That's when you're in the air, you're getting disoriented during your tumbling it can be really dangerous for somebody of Biles' caliber. Here's what she told the Today Show back then. I had no idea where I was in the air. You could literally see it in my eyes in the pictures. Like, I was petrified. So Biles is now hoping to make the national team headed to the Paris Games next year. The competition's going to be stiff, as NBC's Emily Aketa knows. But the competition, in some ways, is there because Simone Biles helped set a new bar, right, for what these gymnasts could do? I mean, she is so good. Is she not a shoe in to make this team? Emily, help us understand it and what this competition tonight means. Well, I mean, she's called the GOAT for a good reason. Yeah. She really has lifted the level of gymnastics to a whole new place, and she's been the inspiration for so many people. But tonight is a massive deal for Simone and for all of the other athletes trying to make their way to Paris 2024. This is the U.S championships. It's a marquee event and this influences who makes the national team, which in turn influences who makes worlds and com can compete in worlds. And that largely oftentimes is an indicator of who scores one of the five, just five coveted spots for Team USA heading to Paris 2024 uh, next year. But you think about it from the perspective of Simone Biles. You know, she just competed in her first event a few weeks ago since her two-year hiatus, as you mentioned, since competing in Tokyo, um, when she really took a step back to focus on her mental health. And there is fierce competition. This is actually the first U.S. championships where we are seeing not one, but two uh, gold Olympian P uh, winners from previous Olympics competing at the same U.S. championship. So the caliber is going to be high. Take a listen here from a former Olympian herself. This competition is one where the pressure is a bit on. A year before the Games is something where that pressure can get to a lot of athletes and we can see a lot of mistakes due to fear and anxiousness. This is the first competition. This weekend is the first of many where we need to see them ready, prepared, and excited to go. 
Mm. So the big question tonight is, will we see Simone Biles pull off the Yurchenko double pike? That is where she literally is flipping three times in the air off of the vault. It is something that she is the only one who, to, who ever has done it as a woman in competition. So all eyes will be, of course, on Simone Biles, Hallie. Emily, my brain can't even compute that. You know what I, I mean? Know, right? Like, I, I barely know how to fall down. Like, I mean, it's, it's incredible what she does. And it's also interesting when you look more broadly at U.S. gymnastics as a whole. Um, they have been through, I mean, listen, the sexual abuse scandals, widely known, widely covered. Some changes have been put in place here, right? They are also trying to enter a new era. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what says a lot is the number of gymnasts who took a step back and then are returning to the sport, like Simone Biles, like Gabby Douglas. Here are some of the changes USA Gymnastics has pointed to. Nearly 70 percent of their staff is new since 2018. They say that athletes have improved access to mental health resources, and they have been tracking their progress with regular anonymous surveys. Also, in terms of progression, $380 million settlement between uh, the victims since that uh, Larry Nasser sexual abuse case. Yeah. Larry Nasser, of course, now in jail. Emily Aketa. Emily, thank you so much. I know you will be watching tonight, so many people will be as well. Appreciate it. That's a wrap for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.